Okay, so I'll be talking about some of our work um, looking at the effects of early life stress on children's neurobiological development and how we've translated some of these findings to interventions that try to enhance parenting as a way to protect children in the face of adversity. Um, and so Kim and Nim have already highlighted a lot of different types of adversity, but I want to kind of overview some of them that we haven't talked about. Um, so we can think of adversity as occurring in a few different buckets. Um, one we might define as childhood maltreatment, and so this could include experiences such as physical neglect or emotional neglect, as well as abusive experiences. Also, in a second category, we can think of aspects of household or family dysfunction, such as growing up in a household with a parent who has a mental illness or a parent who's incarcerated or experiencing separation due to parents' divorce or just growing up in a, in a household with a single parent. And then finally, a lot of aspects of family or community um, factors that influence stress on the family level and on the child level, but also sometimes occur outside of the home environment, such as community violence or poverty within a neighborhood. And as has already been made very clear today, these experiences of adversity can really lead to long-term consequences across a number of domains, including mental health functioning, uh, physical health functioning, as well as aspects of achievement across the lifespan. Increasingly, there's been a lot of attention to trying to understand some of the neurobiological mechanisms, how the body is changing, how the brain is changing, because Understanding these pathways might give us new novel targets for intervention or help us understand how our interventions are working. And so the system, uh, the neurobiological system that I'm going to be talking about is one that we can measure by looking at saliva or spit. Um, and this is really helpful for us for understanding stress in babies um, because sometimes we can't use some of the other measures like looking at brain activity um, or, or asking babies how they feel. Um, and so, and babies have a lot of spit available. Um, so this is a, a nice method that we can use to understand how some of the body stress response systems are working um, with a pretty non-invasive data collection method. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortical axis is one of the body stress response systems that's depicted here, or HPA axis for short. And this system is involved in mounting a stress response when we encounter a stressor in our, in our environment, um, and also um, has a diurnal rhythm across the day. And those are helpful to think about as sort of orthogonal functions of this system. Um, so the stress reactivity piece is one component, and that results in the output of cortisol, a hormone that um, Kim also talked about, uh, which can be measured in hair as well as through saliva. Um, and so cortisol increases when we encounter a stressor, and that actually feeds back to the system to help us recover after experiencing an acute stressor in our environment. But also, cortisol is regulated through a diurnal rhythm across the day, and the HPA axis plays a role in regulating or maintaining typical levels of cortisol. Uh, and this is what the, that rhythm looks like. So when we wake up in the morning, we have a peak of cortisol about 30 minutes after we wake up. Um, so it's highest in the morning, and that helps us mobilize energy and start our day. So that peak of cortisol is, is indicative more of getting up and starting our day rather than increased stress in the morning. And then across the day, that comes down to near zero levels at bedtime. So this healthy rhythm characterized by high cortisol when we wake up in the morning and low cortisol at bedtime is important for a number of functions in the body that have little to do with stress, although are often connected with uh, stress functions as well. So supporting daily metabolism, immune system functioning, healthy brain growth have all been linked to having a healthy rhythm of cortisol across the day. One question then that we've asked is how does stress interfere with this healthy rhythm of cortisol? Uh, what happens when a child is exposed to chronic stress or some of those different types of adversity that I highlighted? So in one study, we collected saliva samples from babies um, under three, so infants and toddlers, who had experienced varying levels of stress in their home environments, um, and then looked at that rhythm of cortisol from, from wake up to bedtime across three days. Um, so we had parents collect saliva samples from their babies, store them in the freezer, and then pick them up and assay them for cortisol levels. 
And what we found, as expected in a low-risk group, um, these are just children from a community without a lot of stressors, they had that typical rhythm of high cortisol when they woke up in the morning and low cortisol at bedtime. Um, so this is a really healthy rhythm that reflects what I showed on the previous slide. Now looking at a group of children who were placed in foster care after being involved with Child Protective Services, we see that they have a blunted or low level of cortisol when they wake up in the morning, uh, and a less steep decline across the day really driven by that low waking cortisol. Um, and so this is potentially surprising to some people because you might assume if cortisol reflects stress, then shouldn't more stress lead to higher cortisol? Um, but what seems to be happening here is a downregulation of the system such that cortisol is actually being produced at a lower level than it should be. And then when we turn to children who are also involved with Child Protective Services but stayed in their own homes, we see the most atypical pattern, which is characterized both by low cortisol when babies woke up in the morning, as well as higher than typ typical cortisol at bedtime. So what you see here is a low morning cortisol level as well as a blunted slope or decline across the day. And we've recently been interested in looking at some of these associations in a less high-risk sample. Um, so we recruited about 100 families near Stony Brook on Long Island um, that didn't experience neglect or child welfare involvement, but were varied in, in exposure to other types of risk factors. So for this study, we added together several socio-demographic risk factors, like having low income, a parent with low education, being a single parent, or having low, um, or being a young parent, and looked at that in combination with factors in the relationship that would characterize or may lead to stress. So having a caregiver who was not nurturing, um, or, or less nurturing than typical in response to a baby's distress, um, not responsive in play interactions or show low delight or positive regard uh, in terms of their affect during play. And collectively, these could be thought of as indicators of low parental sensitivity. And so if we put those together, having risk factors in the environment combined with having a parent who's not especially sensitive, that could be collectively thought of as cumulative risk. What we found was that Cumulative risk, again, reflecting both high risk in the environment as well as low sensitivity in the parent-child interaction, uh, was predictive of, again, that blunted cortisol pattern from wake up to bedtime. So children that were experiencing that accumulation of stress um, were more likely to show this downregulation or blunting of their cortisol rhythm. And so a question, of course, is why care about cortisol, um, and we care about it because, as Nim and Kim pointed out, it really has an effect on the developing brain. And so when we look at behavioral outcomes, we've seen in previous studies that this blunted cortisol rhythm is particularly associated with externalizing behavior, like being oppositional and defiant and aggressive, as well as difficulty regulating anger. Um, and so this pathway suggests a target potentially for intervention. If we can normalize cortisol, we might see some changes in these outcomes that are really important for um, development, school success, peer relationships, and so on. A question, though, is where to target intervention. So um, Kim provided a really good rationale for targeting at the level of some of those stressors, so trying to reduce some of the disparities we see in terms of socioeconomic status. Um, but we can also target the level of parenting, as both of them have really provided evidence that parents serve as important co-regulators really early in life. So the parent-child relationship, especially during infancy, is so central to children developing the ability to regulate their emotions when they experience distress or anger, as well as their ability to regulate their behavior, um, as well as their ability to regulate on a physiological level. Um, parents are really the source of all aspects of regu regulation really early in infancy. 
And so I'm gonna talk about an intervention that aims to enhance the parent's role as that co-regulator by building up parents' ability to be sensitive and responsive in interactions with their babies. So this intervention is called Attachment and Biobehavioral Catch-Up, or ABC for short, uh, and was developed by Mary Dozier at the University of Delaware. Uh, Mary was my graduate advisor, so a lot of the work that I'm presenting was completed in collaboration with her. And so this intervention is a 10 session, really brief intervention that's delivered in parents' homes. So it's 10 hours total, one hour per week for 10 weeks in a row, ideally. And it really narrowly focuses on enhancing the quality of the parent-child relationship. So there are three targets that we aim to address in the context of ABC. The first is helping parents be nurturing when their babies are distressed. That might include verbal support, checking in verbally, physical, soothing, um, or comfort. The second is helping parents follow the child's lead with delight, and this is something commonly referred to as serve and return interactions. When the child serves a bid for attention, the parent returns that serve in a way that's contingently responsive to the child's interest or cues. And then third, avoiding behaving in frightening ways. Um, so this is aiming to reduce behaviors that might be overwhelming for children, intrusive behaviors, or overtly frightening, like being yelled at or, or handled harshly physically. These three targets are addressed through manualized content that guides each session. So a parent coach goes into the home and has a topic that they're gonna talk about each session. However, most of the action doesn't really happen from manual content or discussion. It really happens by coaching parents during their moment-to-moment -moment interactions with their babies. Um, so I'm gonna show you some clips that highlight what those moments look like. Very good nurturing to you guys, and that really lets him know he can rely on you when he needs you guys. Oh, look at, oh, you're just doing all, you're doing the most. I love it, I love it. That's so wonderful. Okay, so that baby had a lot of responsive um, partners there. Um, so what you could hear in these videos, in addition to seeing really sweet interactions, was you could hear a parent coach commenting on those interactions and saying that was a great example of following his lead or that's such great nurturance, how you hold him and rub his back like that, that's so important for him. Our parent coaches for this program are expected to make these comments at least once per minute. In an hour-long session, that means a parent might hear 60 times all of the positive things that they're doing. And that gradually throughout the session, we gently scaffold or coach parents when they're struggling to respond in these sensitive ways, but initially we're very exclusively focusing on the positive. And you could Think of why that might be important. These comments, for one, highlight in very specific, concrete ways what we think is most important in these parent-child interactions. So rather than just saying, good job, um, and the parent doesn't know what was good about the interaction, was it good that I labeled the color? Was it good that I let him play on his own? Um, we wanna be very specific. So saying, good job picking up that block when he picked up the block, that's following his lead and that lets him know, um, or that let, let, lets him know that what he's doing is important to you. Um, additionally, the focus on the positive is really important because for parents, especially parents who are stressed or have been involved with the child welfare system, you can imagine they don't hear very many positive things. Um, more often than not, they're hearing that something's a problem. And so having someone come into their home and really celebrate what they're doing well is a, is a, a huge shift in what they're used to. And so these comments and this feedback can be really rewarding. And over time, we expect that the feedback from the baby becomes what's most rewarding rather than the, the parent coach, um, but initially the parent coach's feedback is, is, is very important. So when we look at outcomes, we 
do see that we enhance sensitive parenting. Um, and this is, of course, what we're targeting most directly. And so seeing this change is really important because it's a mechanism that we think should lead to other outcomes that we want to see. Um, but isn't that surprising, given, that, given how hard we're working to change it? We also see that this carries forward and reduces rates of disorganized attachment in these babies. Um, and for children exposed to neglect or abuse or even a high buildup of sociodemographic risk factors, disorganized attachment, which is a breakdown in the attachment system and the attachment strategy, is seen at really high rates. So the fact that a brief 10 session intervention can impact this is really important. And returning to what we started out with here, um, another question has been whether ABC influences these diurnal rhythms of cortisol levels in babies. So in our control group um, here, which importantly also got a 10 session intervention, also delivered in the home by a parent coach, just didn't focus on sensitivity, what we see is that blunted rhythm of cortisol across the day, such that they have lower than typical wake up levels and a flat slope. In the ABC group though, and this is within a few months of the intervention, we see that their cortisol rhythms are more normal than compared to the control group with a higher level of waking cortisol. And when we follow these kids for years after the intervention, so these data now are three years later, when the children were about four to five years old, we still see that more normal rhythm of cortisol across the day. And given that enhancing early attachment and early self-regulation should lead to other consequences that affect brain development and then outcomes related to cognitive ability or behavioral outcomes, we've tested some other outcomes associated with ABC and found positive effects on children's affect expression and regulation as well as aspects of executive functioning like cognitive flexibility um, as well as behavioral compliance. And also aspects that might point to enhanced school readiness, like higher receptive vocabulary at preschool age. Now when we take an intervention that's been developed and well tested in a research lab and move it out into the community, there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, for those of you that do intervention work, there's a lot of evidence of reduced effectiveness when interventions are moved from a research setting into the community. And this might be due to changes in who's implementing the intervention, changes in training and supervision, changes in fidelity, changes in who's being served by the intervention, but collectively we see this drop off in effectiveness. And so some of what I've been interested in recently is how ABC works in a community setting when it's being implemented um, in a way that's less well controlled, although we still keep a lot of control over it. Um, and so I've had the great fortune of partnering with this fabulous group of people um, for, for an organization called Power of Two. Um, Power of Two is a nonprofit based in Brooklyn, but serving all of New York City right now and scaling up the ABC intervention. Um, and so this photo here shows lots of outreach workers as well as ABC coaches that are doing this work. And to date, I think we've served over 1,000 babies in New York City uh, over the past three years. Um, because it's a short-term intervention, it can be really be brought to scale on a level, level that other programs sometimes can't. Um, so ABC, through Power of Two, is being disseminated for infants in foster care, infants returning home from foster care, as well as infants in communities characterized by risk. And so some of the research we've been doing has been focused in Brownsville, which is a community in Brooklyn that has a really high child poverty rate. And I'll just highlight one outcome that we're seeing so far in an RCT there, um, which is looking at cortisol outcomes. And even in this dissemination effort with coaches hired from the community, some graduates of the ABC program themselves, we still see this enhanced cortisol regulation following the intervention, uh, which suggests that we might be able to disseminate this and scale it uh, and still see high effectiveness in the communities we care about. So in conclusion, I think collectively all three of our talks really point to the important role of understanding sources of stress for children um, and how that impacts children's neurobiology um, and also highlight several sources of protection, parents being one of them. 
Uh, with that, I'll thank you all for your attention and note uh, many collaborators and funding for all this work. And yeah, we'll move into questions.